Hello, everybody. <laughs> and, and, um, I'm set up just <clears throat> ever so slightly. So, this is not gonna be the start of our stream. But we keep it informal. Hey, Marco, how are you doing? Hope everything's fine. The day has been here in Bayern, very kind of gloomy and rainy. And this morning I had uh, my first shot for the tick bite vaccine against, not for, you know, it's a vaccination for uh, tick bites because they can bring bad stuff in some areas and all the south of Germany. Maybe you have it in, in Switzerland as well. Uh, I don't know. Austria, Switzerland, southern Germany, um, Niederbayern, Oberbayern, and uh, I think Czech Republic, Slovakia, and then Russia, and then Hungary as well. There's a same here. Pro okay, proper April weather. Yeah, it's true. That's true. It's nice. But, ah, I, 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 you know, it's not hurting that much my my arm but <laughs> it's always because i'm i'm left-handed and um usually doctors want to do it on the right hand because they think i'm gonna use my my left hand more but in my case it doesn't quite apply so i'm it's the same thing <laughs> and uh, i actually believe still that all of the covid shots that i had were on my left and I think it's better because I use my right hand more. Even if I'm left-handed, I use my right hand more than my left one, uh, especially for playing. So, I mean, you don't have to... The good thing is that your arm with vaccines, usually with shots, usually hurts when you lift it, right? When you lift your shoulder muscle, you contract it. And when you play piano, the one thing you must not do is to do this. Right, you gotta ha gotta be like this. So there's no reason why you cannot play unless you're doing weird, <laughs> so gear, geek stuff, you know, like shredding things. You'll be here, but you know that's how it is. So um, what you see here is my repaired <laughs> for the joy of James, who's not here yet. I think my repaired DW eight thousand. Okay. So Valeria kind of opened it for me and then checked it out and then we did it together. We just, you know, nothing is broken. Unfortunately for everybody, this thing is still working. <laughs> it is hated so much. Why is it hated so much? I think it produces beautiful sounds in wave shaping. And um, I don't know. People hate it. I don't know. So uh, we started early because... Uh, why did we start early? Ah, because I wanted to do setups with you. So today we're going to talk about immersive audio, what it is, and why <laughs> is it the scourge of the earth, and why is working with immersive audio, I wouldn't say problematic, but it adds to a lot of weird stuff. So what I need to do is, I ah, I need to hook up my third camera. In case we want... Do we want to see what the Amiga's doing back there when I write stuff? I don't think we do need it. So, that's okay. And uh, for now, I have my microphone here on this tiny stand that it's cleverly masked by my super muscular body. <laughs> so, you can't really see it, but it's a tiny little stand. Right, here you go. Where I put my lavalier here. And uh, so, what do I need to do? I need to go uh, shut the windows down, just because it's all gray, it doesn't quite matter. And um, turn on my gear. Yes, three and five, at least. <clears throat> all the pedals are starting up because we wanna we wanna use real instruments in that template. So. We turn them all on, make sure that the mix on the black hole is at full, the Moog, everything is turned on. The Prophet here, the 12E, is here, right on. Does it look on? Yes, we can see the lights, the tiny lighties. 
Um, so I'll be right back. Just hold on. Almost there. Almost there. Okay. And all the way to the back. How much do I want? Maybe one more hand here? Let's see. Too much weight, too much weight. Okay, so this one down as well. Boom. This is there still. Nothing. Oh, yes. Uh, programs. Audio. Sonics. This guy. Okay. This is Sonics. This is one. Why is this one? Kids. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. So, the Amiga is on. It's the virtual instrument loaded. Oh, that that stand is in the way and it's obnoxious. Um I'm going to set up my my DW thing here. Uh I don't think it's going to bother anyone except the people <laughs> that that hate it. But we have Bobox cables in the way, so we coil them. So this is a great moment to just show you how you should coil this. You just do this thing, right? Hold it, twist. I'm sure you all know how to coil audio cables, but... Okay. Right on. Here. Boom. I know you, you notice it's a Bobox cable because it's got that orange nicely strip. So we take this to the authorities and we move the 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 eight thousand here on the other side. So I think is do you, can 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 you see this? Yes. Okay. I don't know for whatever oh, you're here for whatever reason. The flickering settings in the Logitech camera don't really apply, but I think it's kind of fun and nice. That I can, I don't know. They look like candle lights. <laughs> look how it's really nice. All right, so hold on. This one goes. What else? Okay, this guy is off. So this we need to set up. Do we put these long cables? Three, four, three, four, and uh, three, four is going to seven, eight. So they do look like candles, right? Because on my preview, I can see them flickering, but I am sure, dead sure. Actually, we're going to test it out. Image adjustments, exactly. Anti-flicker, PAL, 50 hertz. So it should be 50 hertz flickering. Maybe because I have manual expo exposure, the what the aperture, the shutter is kind of weird. But it's not obnoxious. It's actually it's actually cool. <laughs> it's inspiring. Um, so the lights are on. The look what I have. Have a Picture of young Valeria with a dog. Here. <laughs> she put it on one of the keywords so that I can remember her. <laughs> she's like she's like 20 meters from here. But you know. Alright. 
It sits on the politics, C sharp and D sharp. <laughs> uh, but it's nice. She has like one of the tiny, super tiny dresses. And it's like the skirt is starting from, from her upper chest. And like, <laughs> it's all mostly it's 80% skirt and just a tiny little bit of a, of the pink shirt with the red cross. <laughs> okay, so putting the cables to their own, like out of the way. And turning that on. Oh, and this one. As long as I as long as I remember to not just run behind there. Let me just move these. As long as I remember to not just run behind in the room, we should be fine. It looks way cozier on camera than it is. I mean, it, it is really cozy, but there's that brown atmosphere from the back as well. It's worse in reality. <laughs> it's it's good, but this is this is much better. Okay, digital life beats the real one. All right, so um, is it all set up? The pedals are on, the keyboards are on, some of the gears are on. The distressors have started to forget their settings. It's an IC with uh, capacitors that kind of die out, and uh, the Fatso I have has the same issue. I don't care, you know, I write the settings down. It's just the, the, the knobs obviously stay there. It's the buttons that some sometimes don't recall. So you start it up and it's got super weird settings and you look at it and you go like, that's not how what I had it set. So, okay. Oh, and the thing is that now we should probably disable those. Right, because the patch there for the Amiga is up there. Um, I think we're all set. And honestly, if I bring my DW here, okay, a little bit in between, okay, I can kind of play both. It would be fun if I put it here, actually, because it's in the shop. Hold on. I simply have I simply have to find a socket here. I think I have one in the back. I have sockets everywhere. I'm super prepared. Hold on. Gotta go to the back of the sink. Here. There. Boom. Good. Easy. Which also allows me to put the audio cables behind me. Okay. So given the setup, I don't actually need to move that much, which is good. Right? I've even done this. Look, I have a special camera inspired from a very famous old kind of video game I have headphones obviously which will keep at hand here I should actually make a headphone stand out of these mic stand it's an old <clears throat> old trick in the book so here let's do this that should help right boom okay so we got headphones we got our computer, we got the cameras, we got our extra keyboard here, actually here, here. 
wow, it should almost be permanent if people didn't hate it so much. Here, the, the keys are so noisy. Hear that? Really hateful in comparison to the base station. <laughs> That's a nice setup. Look at that. That's a nice Emerson setup. Um, so we got it. We have pretty much <laughs> good for percussion. Yeah. I mean, you can probably hear it through the lav as well. And Valeria said, like, to test it out, it's like, put a normal piano sound so we can hear how it works. And I was like, <laughs> what? I mean, a normal sound. <laughs> what? <laughs> it doesn't have any normal sound. Although, like, the 16 waveforms have sawtooth in the beginning and sine at the end. And then there's hell between 2 and 15. But it is a very nice <clears throat> synthesizer. And to me, it has a very significant footprint through, yes, some of the 90s AC jungle um, approach thing. The, the key bed is dreadful, but actually you, Marco, said it's good for percussion. Most of the sounds that you might, you know, kind of generate on the 8000 are glassy percussion based somehow. So it's got two oscillators, one filter with um, EG for both, you know, filters and amplitude, a modulation generator, a digital delay, which people seem to forget about, but it's actually capable of becoming sort of a, a like a Haas effect on sounds. And it's quite nice used that way. I don't quite use it for very long delays, but for like feedbacks on very short timings. And then it's got aftertouch, which I think I have never ever used. And the arpeggiator's clock that you, I mean, it syncs to MIDI, it's, it's yeah. I mean, and it's written on the chassis, everything it does. So it's quite nice. So I think, as I was saying, that instead of having this camera, which is nice and it's always worked, I've made this camera. <laughs> Look at how tiny I am, but it's kind of easier. I mean, it doesn't need to be this retro, but see, I mean, this is it's going to cover our channels. And so for this specific video, I thought it would become a, a, you know, a hassle just to have myself in here. It's too big. And if I make it too small, like in a square, it doesn't quite work, but this, this works. <laughs> so I am as out of the way as I can, and we can discuss what, you know, immersive audio and things do and plan it. So we're going to try that out and uh, it's going to be a live stream. Let's do the introduction for it. Hello, everyone. Welcome in this. Oh, actually, no, forgot something. There we go. <clears throat> now it works. Hello, everybody, and welcome. This live stream, it's episode number eight, is going to focus, and this is the introduction, which is super serious. And I'm going to pretend that I am I know the outcome of what's going to happen. This episode, we're going to talk about all about immersive audio. It's about Atmos mostly with ambisonics to binaural audio. Why do we have to combine these three? Well, when you talk immersive audio, you talk about a generic thing in which it you're just meaning that you want to have a specific audio format that will make the listener feel immersed in audio. So 2.0 are very old school stereo, left, right, is not immersive. It feels immersive sometimes, but it is not classified as immersive. Mono isn't either. Left, center, right isn't either. Adobe 5.1 would be immersive audio, but in the years, I don't know if you know, Dolby 5.1 is now obsolete. 
not obsolete because it's used a lot, but the hype you hear in a lot of magazines and TV and stuff is about immersive audio. So Dolby stepped the game up quite a few notches and created the Atmos format. So you have <clears throat> you saw, mm, so you have seven speakers, one low frequency sort of handling device, whatever you want to call it, just to keep it as people call it subwoofer, right? Uh, and then you have your ceiling stuff. That's right. You have stuff on the ceiling. So oftentimes you will see a 7.1.2 or a sort of 7.1.4 as well, because the ceiling can be done in X, Y, which is kind of a weird thing but it works, or with the typical front, back, left, right. But in a way, you still have a sort of a half sphere, like a semi-sphere, in which you are in the center of, right? Which you are in the center, and this gives the mixing engineer the possibility of just moving stuff around. That's essentially most of what Atmos is, but it physically needs 7.1.2 or 4. It needs ceiling speakers, it needs the bed of stuff on your ear level, it needs the additional channel. It's complicated, okay? Other formats, there's tons of, of, of sub-formats or less known formats, but if we talk Atmos, we should say 7.1.2 or 7.1.4. How many people have the possibility of just enjoying music in a 7.1.2 format or 4 format speaker room, all right? Speaker powered room. Very few. So a lot of the stuff that gets enjoyed in immersive audio is lo and behold on headphones. Many of the people that are going to enjoy our immersive audio stuff are probably I never I'm not thinking I'm not envisioning that there's gonna be people who are the majority being that they have speakers like you know out of all the people that enjoy your immersive audio mix 70 percent is gonna be on speakers and then 30 is gonna be on headphones that's never gonna happen also because headphones are okay they're easier to take around with you they're uh, you know, just exactly. Uh, <laughs> Steezy, I wish you could send me any second interface. Well, for Atmos, if we're talking about Atmos especially, uh, which I think you're not, but <laughs> if we're talking about Atmos, we would need not only the speakers, that's a good thing actually, a good reminder, we need the channels to output that there. So you need an interface that has the capability of sending 7.1.4 to your different speakers and cables, you know, power cables as well, audio cables, all that jazz. So it works, but it doesn't quite work as much as headphones. So Dolby and Apple mostly have devised different ways of, um, what I will say. All right. So Dolby and Apple had devised a way to fold or just to transcode whatever people do on their Atmos mix to headphones. Is this binaural? It is. It is in the sense that it's translated to the possibility of having that on all the two speakers, which is the left and right headphone drivers. Okay. So all of a sudden you're mixing in an environment that is virtually 7.1.4, but your mixing engineer has headphones and delivers something that is made for Atmos, but will be enjoyed mostly by people with headphones. Now, the nice thing about this is that if your delivery format file is used to make Atmos prints, it will work. So this is important and this is huge. And it also can generate Apple special, spatial audio. Why am I saying Apple spatial audio? Because Apple made something completely different because they didn't want to abide by the rules of Dolby and made something of their own. And so Apple Spatial Audio is also specifically looking at their own products because Apple said, we make specific set of headphones, in-ear headphones, like earbuds and stuff, and we can fine tune the result of spatial, spatial encoding to our own earbuds. 
the AirPods Max or whatever their name is, right? On top of that, Apple said, we can even do head tracking on our in-ear buds. And I said, like, how do we do it? Well, if we place a gyroscope into the earbuds, they will re they will know sort of you know I don't I don't know how the technology works if it's just gyroscope if it's tiny cameras whatever just sensors, you know it will understand if you're rotating your head, and so an Apple spatial audio mix is immersive in probably an additional kind of sense. Right? Because what you have is that if you're listening to something and you're considered centered, for example, like this is my center, and I turn my head to the right, the mix will shift, will rotate right around my head movement, which is essentially as if I were in a concert room and weird digital, analog, whatever sounds are around me, and I turn my head to one of the sources. Obviously, the other sources will rotate around me. So that's what's happening. It's tracking where your head starts in balance at zero, and then where you're straying, how much you're straying off the path of that zero. You know, whether you're tilting, whether you all of that. And so the sphere, the virtual sphere, rotates around you. And it's super complicated, but it's actually easy enough for people to mix and do. Okay. So how much of my life have I worked with? immersive audience atmos probably 5% or maybe i don't i wouldn't even want to say 10 but 10% and most okay why is that because the music i have been commissioned to write and then i've been writing for whether it's a video game or a tv show it's just plain stereo okay it has to be more mono compatible than it has to be immersive audio compatible if there's something my stereo mixes should do is maybe to just kind of have the right balance, which is mostly what the audio engineers in production will do. Will It must not overcome the sound effects. It must be appropriate to the content that the developers or whoever's done, you know, ask me for. You cannot write a fantasy soundtrack if they're doing a science fiction video game, right? Something like that. And that's pretty much it. When you deal with immersive audio, in terms of being given the task to, you know, create it somehow, as a composer for a video game, probably, I, I don't know, maybe there are people doing that, but to give the composer the choice of specialization around the subject is probably never going to happen just because the character in the video game and the way it's interacting with the environment will dictate where things are coming from. So now you have the sound engine, whether it's Unity, whether it's all the things they do that is integrating your sounds, but music will be probably never environmentally contextualized, right? It will just be music. It will not come from a specific source. It will just be music because otherwise it just adds to the environmental a sort of like situational awareness that your character and you as a gamer have to have, and it's just a complete mess, okay? Not to consider that a lot of gamers turn the music down in a lot of video games or off because they want to hear their enemies, you know, their opponents, their foes, right? The mobs, whatever. So, you know, I, I'm not envisioning that, but just speaking on my own, I have never done immersive audio stuff for being placed into an environmental context for a video game because music of that kind was never requested to me. But it would be awesome if we set up a template that could work or just give you ideas on how to do it because in a, in a way you could develop a template for working with immersive audio whether it's Atmos or Ambisonics, we're going to see Ambisonics in a second, or binaural, in a coherent format that will allow you to not have to go outside of that um, template, that for song format. I think it makes sense as composers to create something that is versatile enough to just print different versions of the scene. So if somebody says, this would be awesome, can you make it 
you know, Atmos compatible and you've been doing stuff in stereo, well, now you have to print stems and import them into an Atmos template. But if you worked with a certain amount of specialization and you respect uh, some tricks and rules and stuff, you will probably be able to generate a stereo mix that considering that all rules are being broken lately in mixes, in songs, in pop culture, and in soundtracks for games or movies, it's, it's hard to envision that somebody's gonna say like, well, there's a little bit of out of phase 50 Hertz and we cannot work with it as audio leads in the video game. I don't envision that, okay? So it makes sense to do it. So here we are in Nuendo, which in my opinion is the prince or king, king actually, the king of immersive audio. It had immersive audio capabilities before immersive audio became even remotely popular. Trust me, like insane, okay? It could do stuff. I think even head tracking via OSC servers could be done in Nuendo way before people knew what, I don't know, the average pe person knew what an OSC server was or what maybe track IR decoding through AR sensors and things would do, okay? But you can actually set a mix in here in a way that while you're mixing, you will turn your head around and it will detect your head tracking in a way that Nuendo will pan things around, okay? I personally don't do it because I like to feel the center in my headphones, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I guarantee you that. You can do it with Waves and X. You can do it with a couple open source projects. Um, I have a friend who does it with actually camera code through a small Linux server computer or a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, a Raspberry Pi through Linux, sending things back via, I think, USB. I don't remember what protocol he's using to get into the OSC server port again on Nuendo, and it works. And you know, I can turn around and do that. But truth be told, they also do it for environmental immersive movies and videos. So it's not just for writing music. He doesn't write music, you know, like that. So what I wanna do is I wanna start from the super, super, super basics and try and see if we can keep up with all the different things that we have to do. And when we get onto something that makes sense, I've got to check my colors, which are nice, uh, because I, I had them imported as default and Nuendo wouldn't want to do it, but now it does because it's been forced by me to do it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start from scratch, from a template that is no template. It's just Nuendo's new project, okay? And we're going to build an Atmos and by Ambisonic's binaural compatible session. And this is where it could, things go really wrong. So I have no idea how <laughs> viable these will be. We'll introduce a couple of plugins as well that are amazing for folding down to different formats or fold, folding up as well, like format conversion. I don't know how many of you know Penteo. It's the most amazing plugin for doing up mixing and down mixing ever made for mankind. It saved my butt so many times uh, in delivering 5.1 mixes after we had worked on stereo versions that you will, you will not even understand. It's just a godsend. And it's been updated to a new version and I just installed the new one. It, I hope it works. So, Let's go by steps, okay? When you do Nuendo, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch to this tiny camera as well, because the less I am in the way for you, the better, I think, okay? I hope I can also set the stream for you because what I wanna do is I want you to be able to put some headphones on, wear headphones and listen to the the spatial audio examples that we'll test, okay? Just some examples. So our first thing is, how does it work when you open Nuendo? You open Nuendo, you give it new, and this is what you're presented with. It might be different for you, but in general, 
What you see here on the left at the bottom is some channels called Aurora 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and up to 15, 16, no input at Aurora 1, 2. It makes very little sense for a lot of you, but this could be also a crash course on the Lando, actually. I hope it comes out that way. What this does represent in the mixer when you go create a new session is what you have in the inputs and outputs and audio connections in general of your preferences, right? Because you either create a template or add preferences for your profile, your computer will know pretty much what interface you have. This is given when you go to the studio setup. You go to studio here, I'll show you the, the examples. So we make a real crash course on the window and go to studio setup, which I've mapped to shift F4. Okay. Maybe you're interested in switching to Nuendo. Maybe you want to know about why it's kind of cool. I had to use it because people in my team that I joined maybe a year and a half ago now were using Nuendo. So I had to make a switch for them because we're trading projects and writing stuff in between. I had to. So the first and most important thing is you set your audio system and you make sure your sample rate is at 48 kilohertz and your buffer size for your audio card, that's my control panel, is set to 512 samples. That's what you need to do. It's a standard 24-bit resolution, 48 kilohertz sample rate, 512 samples standard, in this case I have a streaming mode standard, for your interface. Three things, 48, 24, 512. This needs to be there. The adjusting for record latency, um, multi-processing, ASIO guard, all this stuff is not fundamentally important, okay? But I have it set this way. I don't know whether it could be better to just not have ASIO guard because it creates an additional buffer. You know what? We're going to take it out just to try that. I don't release the driver when the application is in the background because it creates tons of issues, even on Macintosh computers. Apple computers just don't do that. Um, then we take a look at the channels. So as you can see, because if you don't know this, you're going to get driven to oblivion. My Aurora 16 audio card via USB has 16 channels. Okay? And I don't know why I had renamed this. It has 16 channels. Now, the port name, you see here, there's it's externally clocked because my antelope is clocking the Aurora. And I have 16 inputs and 16 outputs. Okay? Very simple. The inputs are called Aurora USB Record, and the outputs are called Aurora USB Play. Personally, when we start a new you know, template, I would advise you to, if you don't like the names, these show as, just change it. So we go Aurora out one. <laughs> How cool is that? Or actually, sorry, this is in one. In one, okay? Aurora in two. So I'm, I'm gonna go, you, you can't, okay, you can do it with arrow down. Three, four, so I'm gonna go copy the relevant part, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, you guessed it, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Now, if you only have an audio card, probably you know what you could do? You could just call these A in one and not Aurora in one or just in one because that's your input, doesn't quite matter, right? But definitely USB play makes zero sense to me. So maybe you like it, but I've been meaning to do this for all my life. Just rename stuff. It's the most fun ever. Create something that gives you peace of mind in knowing what it is, where I am at here. Okay. So look what is here. 13, 14, 15, 16. I had already renamed, right? Stream L, Stream R. For now, let's not do that. They just call them 15, 16. However, because my um, sort of stream outs and monitoring outs are hardwired, 
they're not really, but to me, they're in stone. They're exactly how it should be. You could rename these so that they bear a different name. But for now, let's just rename them like this, okay? So we got our ports set up. The next thing you would probably want to do is your MIDI ports. We're not going to do the MIDI ports now because I think they're fairly set up, right? We hit OK, we're done. So the audio setup is set. The other thing I would do in Nuendo is go to the preferences, go to control room and make sure that use phones channel as preview channel is mapped in. Just check it because the phones channel is a preview channel. We want to have that. Then everything else is pretty much on you. Reference levels, main dim, whatever you want to do. But remember, we got to do this for sure. Okay. It has to be a preview channel. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to effortlessly use the binaural and stuff. Now, are you ready for confusion? Because this is confusion. I don't know if you have any question right now, but if you're ready for confusion, it's going to be confusing. So I'm back at the studio setup. Okay. We know what this is. We know that this is our physical audio interface. That's our physical hardware. I'm teaching it to you the way I was teached in Munich uh, two years ago or something <laughs> by my colleagues. They said like, do you have four hours? Yes. And they were like, all right, say when, shut your phone down. We got to tell you how to do it. Otherwise we'll be trading projects that will explode on each other. <laughs> I still remember that. So this is my hardware card. Okay. And we have record and play. This is the names that the Windows computer sees, but we have show as. These are our physical channels. All right. Awesome. Are you ready for this? Okay. We have to close these down and I'm going to open another pane, which is audio connections, not studio setup audio connections. Why is it easy? Because they're placed at the very opposite sides of the menu studio. So this is your studio, your studio, your studio, right? Just remember that. So virtual studio, also your physical studio. So we go to audio connections and now we see something completely disturbing or not. Okay. We have inputs, outputs, groups, effects, internal, external effects, external instruments and control room. So why have I said this is going to be painful? Because we already set inputs and outputs, right? No, we set the hardware mappings of this. But in Nuendo, you could map, you can map to a physical hardware connection or you can map to a bus created into the audio connections pane. And it's essentially the same thing, but we need to map these things and create them. Otherwise it will be a problem. So as you can see, Nuendo has created the 16 parts for me as buses, but these names mean nothing. Unfortunately, they're very close to the ones I've set. But if you remember, my versions have Aurora in 1.2 and these are not Aurora 1.2. This, this is different, okay? So this is a name that I would give the bus, for example, just input 1.2 and needs to be connected to an audio device, okay? Oh, hey, Ratchat, this is Steinberg Nuendo 13. And um, as I said, this is the, I would say the king of immersive audio right now. And it's been as such for years. And so this is like the centerpiece. I have to use this for the work I do with other people because we trade Nuendo sessions, but Nuendo has been the standard for immersive audio for years. And if in my opinion, that's still the most solid platform. Other ones are catching up, but Nuendo had the things we used today years ago when nobody cared. So yeah. 
uh, it, it's a really good DAW. If it, it's complicated for sure, but it can do everything. Once you're in here, there's few things that it won't do. Sometimes it just gives you headaches, but it works for the most part. So this input one two needs to be connected to an audio device. Why would I want to have a bus to connect to an audio device? Because for example, and this is where it gets complicated, I could route one, two, three, four, and other stuff to, I don't know, input one, two could be seven and eight. This is just a name. This is just a software. For example, I could have my Moog connected here. Now this track input can be used as Moog in. So a lot of people hate this and um, they don't really use this part. In fact, for our tasks, now we don't need to, to do that, you know? And so in fact, we'll disconnect that. And Ratchat, you said, does DAW affect the quality of sound directly in terms of, of bytes and bits? No, it shouldn't, unless something is wrong. But there's tons of different parameters that are changing the way you set volumes or pans or just pan lows and different things that in the end will probably make one track printed with one doll different sounding and not matching towards another one. But if you take a sine wave test signal and you put it in different DAWs, if everything is done correctly, they should match 100%. So DAWs have no sound technically, but they give you a better sort of workflow or a worse workflow. And if your workflow is better, probably your music is gonna sound better for some reason, I think. That's, that's what I think. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna erase all this because in theory, all this does not need to exist. We don't need inputs for starters. And we don't need outputs. We had a map in hardware, we don't need the connections. Now the group effects we're not gonna use for now, we keep it clean, and this is my external effects. So the external effects, we keep them as they are because this is mapped to the pedals that I have here, right? I have, and you can see them, all here on the bar next to the LEDs, you see there's five pedals and there's a couple sometimes that I use for sampling and stuff. So these things, they're mapped already to the correct outputs. I need to keep them there. It doesn't matter. It's my own setup for the studio. But this is where you would set up your external effects. If you have a reverb, unit, or pedal, you set it there, right? And this is what I've done. A timeline, a big sky, a volante, Avalanche Run, Black Hole Pedal, and my M3000 Reverb. They're all mapped here, and I can access them as plugins, but they're actually physically there, right? Then we have external instruments. This, again, has nothing to do with the immersive sound approach, but this is the setup of my studio. I have a Prophet 6, Voyager, Baseline. I mean, all of these people are connected, minus actually the Nord lead. I don't know why. Probably I moved it in connections or something and they go to different MIDI channels, all that, so on and so forth. Here, you would set the instruments that you can play that are physically external to the DAW, right? For example, you know, my Moog, that's an external instrument, right? You set them all here. It has nothing to do with immersive audio, we keep it there. But then <laughs> we have Control Room. So Control Room is yet an additional layer that Nuendo has. And I'm telling you this because this is going to create issues with your spatial audio, immersive audio template. It is gonna matter. So we have to cover it because you can turn it off, but I would still keep it on and just see where we are, okay? You have mainly four bus that are important to the control room. And our control room is this thing on the right. Okay, you see stream here on the top where I can turn it on and off. Let me, let me just make these um, always on top. Perfect. So you see this stream that I can, you know, turn on and off here on top. This is a control room thing. So it's not in the mixer. It's not in the song. It's nowhere. It's just a routing for me to send audio to, for example, you because it's stream, right? That's what I've created. 
So if I erase this Q, you know, I remove it, you see that on the top there, the stream Q has been removed, right? If I were to remove the phones um, tab here, for example, I could do it. Let's try that. You see, I've removed it from the entries, the bus names in control room, and it's now away from, it's not, you know, not in, on, in the middle here in my control room. The only thing I'm left with is a metering channel, which I have in digital, but for here, we're not gonna use it. So you cannot really remove it, but you just don't assign it to anything, and a monitor. So if I remove my monitoring channel, I now have just the main outputs of my DAWs in hardware that it will output to, but it's completely different. Like this is as clean a template or, or a startup song as it could ever be. There's literally nothing, not even in the control room. So what we have to set here for future references, if we're mixing an immersive audio, we need our headphones to, unless you have a physically compliant Atmos studio with 7.1.4 speakers or two, you need headphones. And that's how I've been doing it for the past year or something. Not all the time, because I write most stuff in stereo, but I'm gonna show you what I have to go through ah, to make something that works in Nuendo, because to me, it was absolutely not easy. I hope this video is going to be my own contribution to the world. I don't know. I, ho I hope I don't drive you into more confusion, but. We need a phone's channel. So we right click this, and, or we just click on add channel and we go add headphone. We need to add headphones because we need it. We need a monitoring solution for hearing stuff. And in the control room is where you set up your listening mixes and cues, everything that goes to your actual monitoring. If you put plugins in the control room because you would like, for example, your headphones to have a little bit less bass, it will never get printed. It will not be part of the song. And this is why it's very nice that Cubase and Nuendo have it. It's a section of your virtual studio that only relates to monitoring, not to printing audio in any way. So there's no mistakes that you can make by putting something in control room and then accidentally finding it printed. If you have room correction software, if you have Sonarworks, Arc, um, Dirac stuff, if you have anything, you can put it in control room, it will be completely you know, different. Here I have to set up my audio device. Now, this is the first time I actually have to drive my phone's channel to a physical output. In my case, this is my studio, it's my example. 15 and 16 are my monitoring. They are both my speakers and my headphones because I have a monitoring station, it's the dangerous monitor. And the dangerous monitor is connected to a dangerous MQ and so I have everything in hardware. Everything that goes to 15, 16 goes to my monitor hardware controller. So these can be my headphones can be different pairs of headphones, different pairs of speakers. The computer must only know one thing, 15, 16. That's the only thing because I go out of 15, 16 to my monitor controller via audio cables. Simple as that, you know? So, so this is how it works. 15, 16, it needs to be mapped. But on the other hand, all of the inputs and outputs that had been placed here will not be necessary right now. So I would say we close this. Are you a full-time composer? Yes. I also teach a lot, but I also to survive uh, in, in my environment, I write a lot of music, but not all of it gets licensed. So it becomes my own or it gets licensed year after. Well, yeah. And I've been doing these back since 2020-ish. Yes, and then full-time back to 2021. I was more into audio engineering and producing other bands or doing keyboards and engineering, mixing, recording, mixing, some mastering as well. But then after the pandemic, I just closed up the studio I had and started composing again, but more full-time and then became full-time. I like it better, so I'm okay. That's a good thing that the pandemic did to me was that.
So, <laughs> all right. So we need inputs, outputs. How do we set these up? Nice. Um, the first thing we need to do is check that our control room has the settings we dialed in. We got a phones channel, the metering we're not going to use, but it cannot be removed, believe it or not. And um, our phones and main tracks are here. Now, the main we can disable because for now, I'm not going to listen to anything on my speakers. We're going to use headphones. What we need here is we're going to take one track and put it to play and try and get you the stream audio for this. How do we do that? Well, first off, as we know, it's a secondary stream track, right? For now, it would be a queue. So I would do add queue, call it stream, stream actually, stereo configuration, connect it to 1314, which is my map for your stream, and you'd be done. Now here, you would be hearing my own mix, you see it up there, and I can prove it to you, because if I go to file browser and I go to snare, or maybe, oh, let's take a snare sound, place it here, convert it to the formats we said. Now, if we listen to this track and we map it right, you should do this. We should hear, we should hear it out, right? And Marco, you're asking, can you do this setup also with Cubase or only with Nuendo? You can do this setup 99.9% .9 in Cubase as well. As far as I know, with the new version 13, right? with Cubase, because it follows what Nuendo has, these should actually be interchangeable. So if I send you something done in one way or another, it's called exactly the same, it translates exactly the same, so what I'm telling you here should actually translate one-to-one. -one. The different things that Nuendo can do are more related to... I'm not even sure the head tracking is now into... There's tons of things that Nuendo can do with external Atmos rendering, for example. If you have a different render, or I don't know how the mapping to hardware will be, but I'm envisioning it will be pretty much there. But if you're doing Atmos, sending out to a different render for external rendering for the bed and objects, I think you cannot do it with Cubase, but it's a, it's a very full-fledged feature. So I would say 99% of what I'm saying here will apply. Okay, so let's do a first initial setup of something super normal. We're not doing any immersive audio. What I want to do is I want to listen to something uh, that I've placed here. Okay, so I'm going to press play. Probably let me just try and lower this down. I'm going to press play. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you'll hear it, maybe not. I'm not hearing it. You're not hearing it. Why is this not happening? Well, we got to go into the outputs of our track. So we open the mixer and we see that my snare A bus here does not have any output. So it's got no input. And as you can see, I can choose no bus and it has no output. It has no bus, right? Why is this happening? Uh, this is exactly how it was explained to me, and I hope it's effective because it kind of worked. So I press play, I see the meter is going up, but I don't hear anything. The track has no input and has no output. But we saw in the studio setup that my interface is recognized, right? It's got all of the 16 ins and outs. Why can't I choose it here? Because it's not present in the inputs and outputs of audio connections. There are some exceptions, but if it's not in audio connections, you cannot connect to it. Super easy, right? So we need to make an input for it, just as an example and an output. So suppose I want to record this there. We're going to add an input. For example, it could be a mono track and we call it snare input. And then we choose where on the physical audio card this would go. 
okay? So for example, Aurora in seven, let's say that this was auto assigned, okay? Now what I do is I go here on the input of snare A and look what I have here, snare input. So why is snare input in here? It's in here because it's an input that I wanna use. I can call it whatever I want. I could even call it in seven. Some people like to use the input names. Some people like to use the destination of their names. If you know you always have a microphone connected to it, you could call it the name of a microphone. It works. There's no reason, right? Uh, it could be SM57, right? You see how here it changes name. It's now SM57. But where, do, where does SM57 go? It goes to my input or it listens to my input 7 of the Aurora card, which is in the actual studio setup. So hardware first, studio setup, audio connections next, tracks later, okay? So now I have this input here. So if I wanted to record the snare, I would have input seven, plug it, real, you know, SM57, whatever, do it. But we don't need inputs, we need outputs, okay? So you notice that this has now, input one was deleted, and the input here was deleted and it got away from the left pane, right? There's only snare A, which actually we should color sort of like brown. That's our snare channel, right? Okay, then what I do is I add an output. Now, I need to add an output because if I don't do it, the control room will not map my speakers and headphones to an output. Okay, so take a breath because there's a little bit of confusion in coming right now. And this was confusing for me. We create an output, right? We go add bus uh, because they're called bus. We can choose tons of formats, including the Atmos that we're gonna use, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna go stereo because our headphones are stereo, the speakers are stereo, and we're gonna call it monitor out or monitor stereo, I can't type today, stereo out, okay? You can call it whatever you want. You could call it mon stereo, okay? Monitoring stereo. Now, as you notice, there's a track that popped up with a green fader. The green fader means this is an output channel. And if I select this and give this track just a quick go and press play, whatever. Uh, and I need to assign my track to monitor stereo. And I press play now. You have audio. I have audio from my speakers and my headphones because my monitoring is now sending two things at once. If I go with my hand and mute the speakers or mute the headphones, this is a fully hardware choice that I make. It's no longer into Nuendo. For you, it could be different. For me, it's something I have to do with buttons out there. Why can you hear this there? Why can you? Simple. This track is outputting, you see here the output, to monitor stereo. Monitor stereo, funny enough, that's the headache incoming, is not connected to a device port. So why am I hearing through monitor stereo if I haven't told Nuendo or Cubase where monitor stereo has to go? Because I'm using control room. So if I right click monitor stereo, I can set that track, that bus as a main mix. You see where the headache is. If you assign this to your physical outputs, you still hear it. But because I wanna use control room, which is here, I wanna have my main mix or streams or whatever is happening here panned out, like distributed through my control room. So you make sure that you have a main mix selected, in this case, monitor stereo, you don't need to map it to hardware, which is the thing that is super confusing. And it pops up in your control room, still not connected. And the funny thing is, 
it's fine. It's fine to not be connected because we have my phone's or monitoring channel that goes to 1516. That's perfectly fine, okay? So now my everything I do, if it's panned, if it's routed to monitor stereo, to this mon stereo, will go to my speakers, to my stream, because it's in the control room, and control room is using my, you see here, it's turned on, and it's following the mix. So look what I'm playing, okay? I'm gonna play with the control room. I'm gonna turn your stream off. You're gonna see that the meters are going up, and I'm gonna change your volume here, change your pan, and this will only affect you as the stream. It will not change anything into my headphones because they have a different control, or my main monitors because they have a different control. That's the beautiful thing about you know, control room, especially if you have small audio cards with integrated things, you can use the hardware to replace features you don't have. Uh, you can use the software to replace features, sorry, that you don't have in hardware, okay? You use Nuendo to fulfill something your audio card cannot do. So I'm gonna press play, we're gonna listen to the snare, and trust me, this is necessary if you wanna do Atmos first. <laughs> And I'm going to turn your stream off, so you're going to see the meters go, and then I'm going to just play with stuff, and you're going to feel how it changes, right? So I've been giving you some click probably, if it's set up in the template, I don't know, and then I've been moving the volume and stuff. This has only happened for you because stream, it's a Q channel, that's the star indicating Q, and it's sending to 1314, which is you. This is perfect. So now I could make bass drums, uh, bass for drums, basses for bass, uh, basses for uh, synthesizers, guitars, vocals, and it's a normal mix, right? It's a normal mix because it's a normal mix. It's what we've been doing for years. But now here comes the issue. I don't want to do a normal, a normal thing. I want to do an Atmos mix, okay? So how does it work if you want to create an Atmos mix? You can do it manually and you can do it in an automated way. And the thing is you can probably do it automated the same exact way you would do it as a template, sort of, right? So you have everything set up here in terms of your inputs, your outputs. We know what they are. That's the most important thing and what they do. And we have our control room, right? This is all set in stereo and it's fascinating, but it's boring because we've been doing this since forever. How do we change this session to become Atmos based? And how do we listen to this Atmos session if we don't have the speakers around us. So we need to route everything to an Atmos virtual environment and we have to decode it to binaural because binaural is the format that is compatible with headphones and it helps us feel sense of height, depth, backwards and front, back and front, left to right, all that stuff, okay? To do this, one of the easiest way to do it is go to the main edit window and go to project. When you go to project, you go to see game audio connect as well. I don't think it's something that Cubase does where we were talking about things that Cubase cannot do. We go to ADM authoring, okay? And here we start choosing the format that we have for ADM. ADM is the format that will give us the possibility of printing a file sending it to somebody and say, make an Atmos version of it, make an Apple, Apple spatial audio, make it binaural. It's the, the file that has all of the information, even a stereo mix you can still do from the ADM, okay? But right now we have no format because we're not authoring anything for ADM, which is gonna change because I'm gonna go Dolby Atmos, okay? And I want the format of my ADM to be Dolby Atmos. So here's a cool logo popping up 
And what you need to do is you use a setup assistant because that's the, the easiest way to do it. And it pops up in a new window and the assistant says, important, the audio driver buffer size must be set to 512 samples. We know that, we did it. The project sample rate must be set to 48 kilohertz. And we have green lights, we can do that because we set it. Now, the renderer for Dolby Atmos is, I think, there, is there pop-ups here? Maybe not, maybe yes. So a renderer for Dolby Atmos Atmos needs to be something that understands all the data of positioning, volumes, all the things we will make our channels do, needs to be put into a renderer which calculates that and prints a file. So it's actually a plugin, okay? The renderer is nothing else but a plugin. In our case, if you have an external one, then it's a different renderer, but here it's gonna be a plugin. So which kind of format does our renderer need to be, need to have? And in my case, I want to have it a 7.1.4, which is probably what you want. You could even set stereo and just right off the bat fold everything down to stereo. But our renderer is going to be 7.1.4. We are going to add a main mix channel with the renderer. We're going to see what that is. It's actually in the connections window. It's going to do it for us. So the main channel is going to switch from stereo output to the render and then we also want a bed we want a bread group channel for in we want it in 7.1.2 probably that's at least that's how i've done it i've been doing it we want the seven we want the one and we want the ceiling we want everything we want to have it added so nuendo is going to create the bed channel for me and also while we're at it imagine i have a hundred tracks we say, please route all the tracks to the bed channel, okay? Right now, I only have a snare track. I could do it. But imagine having 300 tracks or 50 stems, 20 stems, right? It will do it for us. So let's recap what this is doing. It's adding a main mix in the audio connections. The main mix is no longer going to be our stereo out it's going to be a 7.1.4 main mix it's going to create a renderer channel to create the rendering for the atmos it's the channel where everything needs to go to make something in atmos it has to be rendered right so we need a renderer which is a plugin we'll see that then it creates a bed which is where things get put in the bed and we'll see in a second, there's objects and there's beds, okay? We want a bed for setting static things, for example, or things that don't move that much. We want to see the speakers in one main bus, mainly. That's the reason. We want to have it in 7.1.2. We're going to add it and we're going to route all the tracks to this bed so that we instantly have the stereo mix ported to Atmos, okay? I'm going to press OK and it did things, okay? Let's check what happened. Let's check what was done here. So, if you see here, we have now three tracks and we have a ton of brown things that I don't want to have in brown. <laughs> Reason being, we're going to go set our track to default. This is the group tracks here. We're going to go um, input channels. I don't want to have it there. I want to have it in white. Oh, no, not this guy. Here, this one. Track to default. This is fine in brown. I think we, we found a good channel here. Then we don't select any region and we select the input tracks and we go white and then we take the standard bed and I put it in input output tracks and I take that color away. Okay, I make it standard. So why is the standard bed when in default green it's in green because it's a bus remember how in a stereo situation you have a mix bus your standard bed is your mix bus simple as that okay so we have snare a let's take a look at where snare a goes it goes to standard bed groups standard bed 
Okay, we didn't have standard bed before. In fact, we still have monitor stereo. We have a render 7.1.4, which is a new track, which has a render track. Okay, so let's follow where our signal goes. We have our snare. It's a single stereo track. Awesome. Where does it go? It goes to standard bed. Standard bed has been configured for us with the right side chains and object and mapping and everything, and it goes to render 7.1.4. So the green track listens, the, it's the funnel for all our tracks for beds, and then goes to our renderer here. Okay? And our renderer down mixes to 7.1.4. So it's still giving us an Atmos mix. Okay? But our phone's channel is doing things differently. So now what we need to check is we need to go back to our connections and take a look at what happened here. Because in here, in inputs, we had nothing, we still have nothing. That's good. On outputs, however, we have a monitor stereo and we have a render 7.1.4. Okay? And here comes another headache. Why is the audio device not connected? Because the renderer 7.1.4 does not need to go to any physical interface or channel of a physical interface. Now, if you have an external renderer, maybe you could set all these out, but we don't. It's internal, it's that plugin there, and it doesn't need to be mapped to anything. But what matters is this is now our main mix, okay? So our main mix is no longer the stereo version, is the renderer. This is what our channels will listen to, and that's our, you know, our headphones included, right? So the group effects, we now have a standard bed. We didn't have it before, right? It's a 7.1.2 speakers, and it's output routing to renderer 7.1.4. I could have done it myself. It's as easy as that. But the assistant did it for me. I could have done 7.1.4. I selected the output for 7.1.4. I created whether into the folder of the um, main buses or not, that depends, and then count one. But the assistant did it for me, okay? External effects has not changed. External instrument has not, instruments hasn't changed. Control room has changed. And now what I need to do, first and foremost, instead of giving you 1314, which is not going to work because you cannot have the stream on two channels if we have a 7.1.4 mix, right? Either it's going to pick the first two channels out of what, you know, 12, or it's just going to mess everything up. So stream cannot be done this way. In fact, I could even remove the actual control room entry there, you know, because it's it's not gonna work. It's not where things are done. Now here on this part, you know, here, I do have the metering channel that is still not set and my phones that are not, and haven't changed. They're still 15, 16, right? That's where I go out there. Now, the problem with this is that it's not probably going to encode to the parameters that I need, okay? I could try, some people um, actually, can I remove these phone channels? Maybe not, maybe yes, yes I can, okay. Let's try and recreate it and go add headphone, okay, hasn't changed, 15, 16, all right, that's my, my, my setup, could still work, I'm checking out some stuff. Let's see, okay. So now our snare goes into the renderer and the renderer has monitor stereo, which does nothing. And the renderer here that goes to 7.1.4, okay. The only thing I wanted to, sh I want to show you is that if I go here, I hear it in my mix and you don't hear it because I've disabled it. 
because I'm going through phones to 7.1.4, but it's the first two channels that are being used and that's convenient. If I do this, I double click on the panner and I go here in bad mode. Now I could move this stuff around. You see that there, right? Uh, I have the top bottom view of this stereo source. And then I have the height as well that I can set, you know, can move things out, up, down, and then front and back. Why do I see these yellow things and these red things? Because the snare track is deceivingly stereo. And because it's stereo, then I need to choose where I want that stereo channel to be. So I have a width parameter here that I can also assign. I can make it fully collapsed in mono, and then I can move it around as a single source. So the deceiving part is my stem here is a snare, but is stereo. So because I had my snare set fully left and fully right front, and my stereo mix coincidentally for the headphones is full left and full right, I think, or I assume, that I am monitoring the correct format for this. I'm going to explain it again because you press play now, as I did, and I heard the snare. So you will go like, oh, this is really nice. Some kind of black magic is happening. I have my main mix in 7.1. I have 0.4. Nuendo must be doing something magical. And I'm hearing through my speakers as I wear on stereo. So this is working. Actually, it's not. It's just coincidence that the snare has been placed left, right, front, and I'm listening through two channels that are left, right, front. Channel one and two get decoded the right way. But if I start using different channels, my monitoring will miss them completely. It's just a coincidence that the first two channels happen to be the first two channels of my speakers. It's a happy coincidence because it's still here something, but it's not working, okay? It's not gonna generate a binaural mix. That's the, the end of your headache is you are not listening to binaural, okay? Is it confusing enough? I don't know if you want to grab something to drink right now. This is, I've done it. I've, I've, I've passed the rite of initiation and I think I've done two or three calls, like emails and then Skype calls because nothing was working, okay? Part of that were bugs, I gotta admit, or like, I, it's not an excuse, it was actually were bugs, but most of that was me forgetting different steps. So it's nice that this is being put on video and that it's gonna get recorded for posterity. If I make a mistake, it's here, it's how I do stuff, it doesn't matter, it's at least authentic, okay? But I guarantee you it's complicated and uh, it you're gonna probably hit the wall a couple times, okay? But it's the nature of the beast. That's unfortunately how it is, okay? So I repeat now, I, I we had a stereo mix, we use the assistant, we're now authoring for ADM, we're now effectively able to print a 7.1.4 mega file package, let's call it package, because package is nice, a package that we give to the studio, we give to Apple, we give to the famous people, and then they can make Atmos mixes, then then collapse perfectly and stuff, but how can we mix if we're not monitoring, right? Well, we pressed play, and we heard that it's actually listenable. I pressed play, it's not going to your stream, but I could hear the snare left and right the way it was before. It's sounding nice, it's okay. However, and this is, was the culprit of it, it's wrong. It isn't set to monitor the right way. The only coincidence is that channel one and two of my stereo configuration where left and right, and channel one and two of this Atmos configuration is front left, front right. So as long as I stay on two channels, 
I have an appropriate translation. As long as I move across the front wall and I go left, right, I'm translating right, okay? But if I start rotating things around and go up and down, nothing works. If you use your headphones, you start losing sounds around because it's not folding down. That's the right term, folding down to a binaural conversion, which means left driver, right driver, headphones, right? How do you do that? Okay. And this is another fun aspect. You see how many traps are there. Innuendo and Cubase, you cannot create a binaural version of your monitoring to monitor from a 7.1.4. You can't do it. So if we had real speakers here, we'd be done. Everything's mapped. We would set the hardware out, you know, all the LFE, and, and then we'll start mixing. But if you want to use headphones, you can't actually have uh, binaural monitoring on headphones from a 7.1.4 mix or bed or bed plus renderer. You cannot do it. How do you do that? You have to use ambisonics or ambisonics. I say ambisonics, but I heard people say ambisonics. It's wrong. It's ambisonics. It's ambient. So it's ambisonics. What is ambisonics? Ambisonics is a different type of immersive audio. It considers not speakers, but a full sphere, 360 degrees, okay? Or at least a half sphere, but in such a density that it has to be recorded with ambisonics devices. So it's super, super cool. There's different levels of ambisonics. There's, I'm gonna show you here. There's here, ambisonics, 10A, 2OA, 3OA, 4OA, but there's 5OA, there's 7OA. The more, the, the higher the number, the more channels you have. And I think by, by fifth order harmonics, that's why OA means order harmonics, uh, ambisonics, sorry, five order ambisonics, because we say order for, for the harmonics as well. So I just got back into <laughs> analog mode. Uh, Third order ambisonics has what? Probably 26 channels or about like uh, four should have about 35 as 35. I don't even remember. But by the time you hit fifth order ambisonics, you need a pretty powerful computer to encode it in real time. And you need pretty specific devices to track it. So what we're going to do is for us, third order ambisonics is going to be fantastic. So third order is enough. Okay. But that's what you see. First order, second one, third, fourth. There are different types of increasingly, um, increasingly denser environments of microphones and speakers. So the more obviously you have, the more speakers you have, the more detailed your movements are going to be, right? It's complicated. But Nuendo and Cubase will use ambisonics to translate to our headphones. So we had to go there. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add an output. And this is where I hope it works because I had a version of Nuendo 13 that would do very bad things on me. What we need to do is we need a monitor for ambisonics. Okay, so I'm gonna go add bass. I want an ambisonics third order harmonics. Uh, ambisonics, well, why don't they harmonics? <laughs> Again, you probably got the gist of it right now. We are not connecting it to anything. You see, this is 15 speakers already. So in a way, it's better than Atmos. Ambisonics, in my opinion, for virtual gaming audio stuff and principles and things, it's way better than Atmos. But I've heard people, there's two people I know who work with object-based Atmos for um, virtual stuff. I mean, they avoid using ambisonics. They're really good, but you need to go on objects, which is, I don't know, we'll probably talk it too, about, about it soon. It's different than beds. But to me, you know, ambisonics still sounds better. So we are going to put this into our outputs, okay? And this one we're gonna call monitor 3OA, okay? 
So this is our monitoring for ambisonics. And we could, you know, we could call it mon OA. But I usually call it mon 3 OA. So that's a monitor stereo, which we're not using. This is a render 7.1.4, and that's a mon OA. Now, if I could, I would probably move this thing around, but I don't think I can actually move them. Oh, yes, I can. Why can't I move it here? I should be able to. Ah, because I created outside of a folder, I think, right? For some reason. But I don't see the mon 3A here. See, the inspector, standard band and render. These are gone. Let me try and actually redo it. Can I create it in, in, in folders or not? That's, um, that's me. Just, no. Okay. They're just there. Okay, 3A out. We don't need it. Ciao. So, we got the monitor stereo. Ah, maybe I have to always on pull. I can't, I, oh, I can't even move it up. Right? Add bus, move it up, maybe here. Well, we don't care. We're good where we are. So we have our monitor stereo. We have our render 7.1.4 and we added the ambisonics part. Okay? So now we need to use this to monitor. We need to send something out of here. And we can do it two ways. Instead of going to the standard bed and then to the renderer in 7.1.4, we should stop monitoring the 7.1.4 and monitor the actual main mix on the 3OA. Okay? First, I want to show you something about the 7.1.4. What I said about not being able to monitor binaural through 7.1.4 through the render is actually wrong in this sense that you can tell your renderer to down mix to binaural and enjoy your mixing. And then when you're done, you put it back to 7.1.4 and your down mix will be rendered to 7.1.4. You can do that. So, you want to listen to your speakers in 2.0, you keep it the way it was, you down mix to 2.0, you will be in stereo back, okay? So it's down mixing everything there. However, the way I want to do it, because I don't work with Atmos, I work with Ambisonics, but I'm trying to do this with you now, is I want to keep the render for the Ambison for the 7.1.4, but I also want to have a 3OA routing that then goes to my phones. So, if I make my monitor three third order ambisonics my main mix, something changed, and I will I will do it again. Take a look at the control room where my phones are. Here, look at my mouse in here. Right there's my phone's volume. There's the metronome or on or, on or off with the pan and, and volume, but there's pretty much nothing else, right? I can only monitor the main mix. I don't have cues, so I cannot choose any cue. And uh, there's the listening for a all the different volumes and stuff. Look what happens when I make my third order ambisonics my main mix, which means that my phones will get a copy of that main mix, right? Boom. Here on mix, below mix, there's a VST MB decoder or decoder. It's a better pronunciation. What is a VST MB decoder? If I click on the edit here, I can see what that is. It's an ambisonics. It's called MB decoder. So now you understand why you can't really decode straight up 7.1.42. Uh, binaural, which you actually can. I demonstrated that to you. But you keep your folding to 7.1.4 in the render, but because now our third order ambisonics is our main mix, we're getting the possibility of folding from ambisonics to binaural. So we have to pick. 
do we want to have the ambi decoder create a speaker monitor or a headphones monitor now if you're going to use your speaker you still can head track stuff and head tracking only works once you're set up with your head tracking which is a completely different topic which we're not going to cover because i don't have head tracking here but if you go speakers you're mapping out to the speakers if you go headphones then you're going to your headphones and here you can choose two rtf hrtf modes which is the profile of your head and ears sorta and there's a company called immerse that creates profiles for you for your own head and ears if you have an immerse profile which is paid for you have to pay for it and create your own you can scan create your profile with your account and it will have the hrtf mode for your head the question is what does it mean it means that it will create a um, it will cheat frequencies when you're moving stuff around that for your own head will be more believable it will feel more realistic because that's the funny thing about it everyone has their own hrtf profile or there's people who react better to certain profiles and other people who don't so in theory if you want to enjoy your music in binaural even atmos or apple spatial audio you should create your hrtf mode or pick the one that in a test gives you the better results there's demos there's things you can dial in and there's a point in which you say like wow this really feels like it's going behind my head and then up it's because your hrtf mode is more compatible with your physical shape of ears and head okay that's that's how it is so i don't have one i'm going to use standard and you can do different things you can trim the output and you know move your head manually by using the knobs so everything stays put and then you can still do yaw pitch and roll you know it's like six points of, of movement uh, we're gonna keep it here so this means that everything that gets sent to my headphones has the vst ambi decoder on this is at all effects it's a plugin that this thing has on so you see here for example i have reverberate with my room calibration this thing i could bypass actually disengage because i'm not even monitoring to stereo you know i'm not going there i'm just going through my headphones so now if i press play now i no longer hear anything reason being the renderer is not my main mix the 30a is my main mix so we need to actually send the bed to the 30a and what we're going to do is we're probably going to create a send and send it here or maybe i wanted to try or uh, let's do it here so the bed goes not to the renderer but to the monitor 30a okay here there's different channels we're not use using the channels we'll go through the 30a so if i press play now i still don't hear anything why don't i <laughs> maybe because this thing is not see that's the thing that i had that doesn't quite work would have been great right if it had worked right off the bat so what can we try and do let me try and do well the foldback will not work okay it's getting that nice okay can i do this okay so this works and it's actually working the way i intended to so we keep everything as it was we're sending the bed to the renderer otherwise it will not become the atmos positioning system but then we send these copy we actually use a send return system right and we send it to monitor 30a this means that once it's hit the renderer which be careful has to still be 7.1.4 will go to the 30a and this will then get encoded to binaural simple as that now how do i know that this is working because 
I could actually set different converters here. But as you can see, I have mix convert, this guy here, which is reassigning stuff, or I could use a different channel panner, could use the ambient decoder, for example, but this track configuration is not compatible with the ST ambient decoder. So you can, and this is, this is insane, but I kind of love this, you can um, use different panners in Nuendo and Cubase alike. So you can use a plugin that is sitting inside your pan knob, and this will decide where you want to go with your conversion. Right? This is insane, I know, but it's how it is. You see here, if I right click and go channel panner, I can use any mix pro, I can use energy panner, I can use mix convert v6, MSCD, render for MPEG, H standard panner, MB decoder, multi panner. Doesn't mean that you can actually use everything, that they will work, but you can set them up. Okay? As an example, let's take our snare track. Okay, let's forget about these. We like it. it's not immersed, everything's fine. Let's take our snare. This is, you see it up there, the VST multi panner, right? This is Steinberg. This is standard default built with Dolby Atmos, perfectly compatible. It works. Now, what if I wanted to use a different panner? For example, I want to use the standard panner. The standard panner has no control whatsoever, and it's just allowing me to not do anything at all. Why? Because I'm outputting to a bed, and this channel with the standard panner is not compatible. So it's a stereo left, right. I wonder what happens. Okay, so it's playing as a mono track. Placed in the center, can't move, nothing can happen. We can't really use this but it lets you select it, right? We can use Energy Panner, which is by Sound Particles, which is insanely cool. And we can now use this to pan stuff. So effectively using plugins into the pan controls, which I love. And one of the reasons why I love it is Energy Panner and Pentel, these two things. Uh, so really, trust me, like having the possibility of using panners into the channels done this way with different plugins is super cool. So here we could use energy panner, but without getting distracted, I'm going to go back to multi panner. So this is the exact sound and I'm going to do actually something different. I want to extract this there. I don't want to have it in mono at all. I want to go to edit. I want sorry, audio and split channels. And I want to extract a single channel and I want to add the split files and lane to the pool. Boom. So now my snare is mythically a mono track. It's no longer a stereo track. And if I press play, it's a mono file placed into a stereo track, which is something we all hate. So I'm going to create a mono track because it's just better. I'm going to call it mono. Oh, sorry, I'm going to call it... Well, I'm going to try and do that with the mono thing, and I'm going to send it to the bed. Let's do this. So I'm calling it snare mono. Okay? So this is our you old snare, and this is our snare mono. What I do is I copy this guy over, and I mute the old snare. Okay? I'm going to make this cyan. No, it's not cyan. It's a blue thing, but... It's okay. Here. Let's do uh, this here and then this guy. Okay? So I have a snare mono right now. And this snare mono is now no longer this guy. See the difference and why I didn't like it? I mean, if it was a stereo track, it was a stereo track. But it's a mono track. That, that snare usually will be deceiving to tell you that it was a stereo track because most snares when tracked or kind of feels mono, right? So see how a single mono track becomes? That's just a little dot, okay? 
So I'm going to actually use this guy, but if that mono file is placed in a stereo track, you will still be able to move this dude with yellow and red. That's how I call it. Why is it possible? Because this is headache number 165. You can have innuendo mono files into tracks that aren't mono, but have more channels than mono. And it's the channel type that dictates which kind of panner you have. Insane, I know. Because having a stereo track with a monophile in it will not make the, 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 the monophile stereo by all means. So always make sure that your track are the correct type because usually that only leads to confusion. So this is fine. We, we like this. We're no longer going to use this guy here. And this snare now can become brown because we want brown and we want this guy brown as well, right? So we're back in having that snare mono. So if I loop this guy now and I mute my speakers and I take my headphones on and finally, after an hour and 38 minutes, I wear them. They're actually a little bit tight, okay? I should be able to hear this snare moving around. It doesn't mean you can hear it, but I'll show you how you can do streams for other people, like producers or streamers or other people alike, because you're probably going to be interested in saying, like, I want other people to hear that as well. So first off, I press play, and I hear it. And it's moving around. It's at minus 16, it's a tad loud, it's a tad quiet. What I usually like to do is I move my output here and I find a level that I like because I don't like to get blasted. We can't have very loud levels. Funny enough, zero is fine. Okay. Maybe it's fine because I'm very far. Let me see. No. Okay, it's fine. Now you need to listen to it because if I, if I don't do it, you're probably going to leave. A few people who left, are, uh, who are still here, you're probably going to leave. So uh, how do we make it possible for you to listen to it? Well, we need a Q channel, right? We know that my audio card goes to my computer for the monitoring to the Focusrite and stuff to 1314. That's a given. What I like to do for these types of mixes is we could try and do two things. Let's redo it with a control room, okay? We have our phones out and then we have our queue. And we call this again stream. And stream is going to be stereo, okay? And we send stream to 13, 14. Now, if I press play here, I doubt you're going to be able to hear anything. And in fact, you don't. Why don't you hear this, even if it's 1314? Because the channels that is going to the ambisonics and phones is not getting replicated here. I could try and go Q. I doubt it will work. All right. So stream is actually a Q system that is not going to you. It doesn't, at least in my configuration, it doesn't work. So we're going to erase this. And we're going to create a physical output in the audio connection and call this stream out or mon stream. Okay. This is the monitoring for the actual stream. And this, lo and behold, for the very first time, it's actually in one hour and a half, is a physical output in the outputs of the audio connection. Because yes, this needs to go to monitor stream. Okay. By all means. So monitor streams. Monitor stream is a track now. It's called the same way. We use it that way. We could call it stream out. Okay. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. What matters is that this thing is now going to 1314. This track here, monitor stream. Maybe, uh, maybe a different color would be insanely cool, but I can't do it because it doesn't show here, but it could, but we don't want to do it. Okay. So how do I send you this stuff? because it's a stereo track, but I have a binaural mix, right? So what we do is I take these 30A 
and I send it to the stereo. As a send, same deal. Monitor stream, copy there. And now you have it. But my thinking is, are you getting the two channels? Man, this is headache number probably about 256. I'm going to use a multiple of 16, right? Or eight. Um, am I sure that you're listening to? I know you can hear it. Right? I know you can hear it. But what if I move my snare around and we take a look at what is happening on your monitor stream? We put an insert on it and um, hmm, maybe we use said to just see where we are with the with the left right content, right? It's just a just a just a what is it? Like a channel display. We could use said. We could even use maths. Um, not the R meter, but the fa not the face. What is it? Oh, I don't have it. Two bus control. No, two bus control. Why don't I have it? I I did have it. Face shifter, multi core. I don't want to do that. Oh man. No. Well, this only gives me balance. Oh, another one we could use is, uh, this is free, the Flux uh, Stereo Tool. I'm going to just show you some, some free examples of what you can use. Okay, I'm going to put them here so that they're nice and we can see them. I'm going to move this there around and you tell me with your headphones what happens. If you, if you hear it, if it's right, if it cancels each other we're gonna start from left front and then hide where and then we're gonna move you know higher and all that stuff okay does it move front to back this is the hard thing to do because people will be, because it's kind of hard to say like well, I don't I don't know if it's really moving. You probably hear it um, moving. I, I will start like doing like an automation kind of thing, and then we track it. Okay, now if I press play, so for the stream, Marco says it moves, and I think you can for you you can still hear it move because the left right is right. But the main problem I'm talking about is, are we sure that the Third order ambisonics is actually getting the real binaural rather than having just the left right channel. Because as we said, number one and two usually translate to front left, front right for obvious reasons because it just helps being compatible when you might make a mistake. But the problem is we might not have true binaural. I know I do in my mixing, but maybe not on 13.14 because we're just sending the two channels on the stereo mix, right? So to do this, instead of sending to a physical group, we should make an additional track, like a group track here. And then send that group track, or bus, we could call it, to the physical out. This way, we can put an ambi decoder and put binaural destination there. Let, let's try that. Maybe it's not necessary for the stream, but I actually think it will, although, again, the HRTF modes, like, if you really haven't failed binaural, it might still feel that it's obviously moving left to right for sure because we're translating things around, but it's not that that, that um, 
effectively being translated. It's just the left-right channels translating or routing to front one and two, front left and front right, which makes it believable, but it's not exactly there. So what we do is we go to group, we go add group, and then we go stereo, or actually, is it a stereo group? No, it's a third order ambisonics group. It doesn't go to standard bed, it will go to monitor stream. You see the danger, monitor stream has two, we you just need monitor stream. And we call these two stream, for example. Okay, and this was placed outside of the folder, but for some reason I would actually want it here. Okay, two stream, okay. I don't want this track to be brown, because brown is clearly my, my snare, obviously. So now we have a new green track, which means it's a physical bus, okay? Look what is happening here. It says 3OA to 2.0. You see that? The panel here? If I double click it, boom! The Ambisonics decoder, ambi decoder, pops up. So this is now, and this is the way I like to do it, I think it's an additional layer that worst case doesn't hurt, but if you have a second person with in another room or a producer over Skype or somebody you want to show your fantastic, you know, Atmos mix that is compatible with Apple Spatial, that is also binaural, but that you're monitoring through binaural and you want the other person to monitor through binaural, or if, you're, if you have a fully-fledged Atmos studio, but over Zoom or Skype you have somebody with headphones, you need to be able to stream to a different channel that goes to your computer inputs or a second audio card and becomes true binaural. And we've got to be sure about it. The reason why I think the previous version is not legit is that Look what is happening here. We have 32 milliseconds of latency because my green track to stream is getting the feed from the, where is it? From the third order ambisonics, which we haven't done. We're going to do it there to stream. So my monitor 30A is my also main mix, which is my headphones, but I'm creating a copy. I'm sending it to a bus, which is to stream, see here, sending the 0, 0.0 volume, to send return, and this to stream is outputting to monitor stream, which is a physical out here, okay? So instead of going through the physical output straight from the send, which is confusing again, but it's possible to do it on Nuendo, we're going from the monitor of the 30A to a bus, and that bus is a 30A bus, but outputs to a 2.0 physical output. When you do this, Nuendo knows that it has to place an ambi decoder on it, because otherwise it will not be transcoded. So you see 32 milliseconds. We were not seeing 32 milliseconds on the previous method from 30A monitor straight to the hardware out, which to me means that you're only sending channel one and two and nothing else. You're not truly encoding binaural, which is a different thing. So if I press play now and I lower this channel here, the mon stereo, you should actually hear that the snare disappears. Or actually, I'm going to start from minus infinite and I'm gonna go up while it's playing. You're gonna see the meters move, but you're not gonna hear the snare, because this is your channel. This is dictating what you hear. So if I raise it and you hear the snare, it means it's correctly routing itself, okay? So it's actually not mon stereo, it's to stream. <laughs> it's getting late. So I'm gonna do it from minus infinite, then I'm gonna go up, okay? Meters are gonna go, but you're only gonna hear it once I raise the fader. right? I saw it on the meters that it worked. So you are effectively hearing it again, but not from the monitor 30A 
to a physical output, you're hearing it from the moderator 3OA to a bus called toStream, which then goes to the output. And that bus is important because it holds the ambient decoder. If you now had speakers and we were discussing a soundtrack or a piece of music I was writing and you tell me that you have speakers, I can easily take your MB decoder, which is the two stream, and go speakers. And now it will be decoded from 3OA to actual 2.0. Okay, so on speakers, it's not being decoded to the speaker system. But if you tell me, no, 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 I have headphones, send me binaural, I can do headphones and it becomes binaural. And it's better in headphones than sending you a speaker's headphones mix because it's just a plain good old 2.0. Okay, also, you could send me the HRTF mode for your head and I choose in here and I can have different streams sent to different channels for the different HRTF modes that my clients or producers have, okay? In order for them to actually send the right stuff. If I had track my head, my head movements will translate to what you hear. So you can't actually do it in sort of like in offline by moving your head and hearing the mix change. I need to print that for you. But for real time, this is pretty good because I can, I can do this, you see it on camera and you know what happens when I'm rotating around. Although in my opinion, that's not entirely like super, super, super important, okay? But you can do that. You can load the profile of a producer. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but that could, would be pretty cool, right? Because they send you the file and you put it there and they have their perfect HRTF. You know, really enjoying the, the, the stuff you're sending. And if you had different cues and different people, you can load different profiles. So how does this in a nutshell work? Well, I'm going to do a, another movement of the snare. And uh, then we see. Let's, let's feel it if it feels any different, okay? And uh, we can even probably keep the ambient decoder for you here so that when I take the speakers out, you hear the difference between a speaker down mix to a binaural down mix, okay? I think height is really where you can feel it if it's if it's working or not. And remember, there's something that I don't want to say it's advanced, but we're still working in bed mode. You see it up here, bed mode, right? Bed mode means that we're placing the sound in the bed. If we use object, now we can no longer use the LFE for the track. So, but it's usually not a problem. But this becomes encoded in such a way that the Atmos engine will place it with much, with much more precision. So usually for things that really, really, really move a lot and have a strong effect on Atmos Spatial, you would want them in object mode, not in bed mode. But you know, bed mode is still pretty cool, right? So let's play it while it's going with the read mod uh, automation and I will switch to speakers while we're going. Right? For me, it's not going to change anything, but for you, it's going to become a speaker mix, not a headphone binaural. I assume, but I'm 99.9% .9 certain that this is actually the way you should do it. And I feel safer knowing that there's, there's a binaural encoder going out to your stream that is two channels. So it's compatible with YouTube, with anything. We don't need any specific encoding, but with headphones on, it just has nice changes, right? So... 
for me, it's, it's the way you should do it. And if I had a type of streamer, I could place, you know, a specific, again, if it's, there's one producer, you can load their HRTF mode, but I can keep these in standard and load the profile for my own head in my own phone's channel. So I can do that. Now on the inserts here, there might be ways to add stuff that, well, no, it doesn't make quite sense. But this is this to me is is how you should do that. So we have this pan, we can place this thing where we want, for example, it'd be higher, lower, exactly something like this. And then we hear it. And we have it. So where has these taken us? We have a mono track. It's no longer going into a stereo field, left, right, bidimensional, bidimensional. It's going into a 3D space, which is handled and managed by the Atmos rules. This means you can use all sorts of Atmos compatible plugins, Atmos everything, okay? It's all Atmos. The processing, the placement, the everything is Atmos. From the Atmos render, actually, I should say it this way. The snare goes into this bed, which is Atmos compatible. The bed goes to the renderer for Atmos, which creates and handles the rule to make this completely Atmos compatible for all, the, you see like mute all beds, objects, whatever. It's, it's the environment that works for the Atmos rules and regulations. Because this system is Atmos, all the tools you can use in Atmos world are gonna be at your disposal, which are probably more widespread and professional uh, in a way that like they, they're, they're getting more seals of professional use than the ambisonic stuff. It's not entirely true, but the hype of all the tutorials, the products that people demonstrate are usually at least Atmos compatible, you know? So you're working within that system and it gives you the certainty of saying, I can render an Atmos file. And that Atmos file, it's not an Atmos file, it's an ADM, which can become binaural, stereo, Apple spatial, everything. But in that ecosystem, I work with the Atmos rules. So to me, yes, it's more of a standard for a lot of mixing today than Ambisonics, okay? Then we take the renderer that goes on its own path and it's making its own final file, ADM, but we take a copy of it. And it's this orange send here that goes to monitor 30A. This monitor 30A is an outer output that is virtual. It's not assigned to anything physical, again, just like the Atmos render. But this is the main mix. So the main mix means that I am listening to it in my control room because main mix is what the control room uses. And the control room has phones, headphones on, right? And the headphones channel has in the control room the VST Ambi decoder, which takes the third order ambisonics and is capable of putting it into binaural. So to do this, we need to go Atmos, ambisonics, binaural. To me, this is still the way. There might be a way to do it from Atmos to binaural straight away with a different channel, but for some reason it doesn't work for me. So I'm safer this way. Atmos, all the way in the ecosystem, we stand the copy, that's the monitor 3A. It's a third order ambisonics track that goes as a main mix to the phones. When it goes to the phones, Nuendo creates the ambi decoder, makes it binaural or speakers, but it's phones, so it needs to be binaural. From the monitoring 30A, we also stand another track. We send a copy of the 30A monitoring to a bus, which has a 30A input, but a stereo output. And when we do that, 
Guess what happens? Nuendo creates an ambidecoder because it notices that it has third order ambisonics and then stereo out. The two things don't work. They need to be encoded. So how do we want to work it? Binaural or speaker? And you can set it up and your stream goes there, right? I even have this monitor stereo that I could use for speakers. So if I wanted to use this for speakers, I could just place it, route it to a different output, send it to the speakers, and have different encodings in real time for a final proofing probably of the stereo mix, okay? The thing is, if you use these in stereo, and if you do it right, it should work. This way, you don't have to down mix your render straight from the, you know, right off from the start. And, uh, and it's kind of nice. You can compose into this. Yes. How do we know? We can try that. We can try and place a track from an instrument. For example, let's try the Amiga, actually. And we send these, you're right, I heard it, to the bed, because the bed is where all of our tracks go, unless they're objects, we we're not talking about, talking about that for now. So we call it Amiga, that's our instrument. I probably can play it here. You hear it? That, do, do you hear it? Yes, you hear it, I'm seeing it there. So it's just a track and it's going in there. Now, the problem would probably be that all of these encodings need time. It's a 32 milliseconds encoding for the stream to you, unless I go speakers. And there's 0.1 milliseconds for the monitor to streams, just because maybe this, because it's MC and um, stereo tools, that's not there. And another 22 milliseconds for the renderer in Atmos, okay? So this could be a reason why if we go binaural here, or we make a mix straight off to that. Well, no, see, it still needs 22 milliseconds. So we get into the thing of like, can you compose into this environment and place things in real time? Do you really have to keep a 512 buffer size? Is there any other way to do it? Oh, well, it's complicated. You see how it, it gets hard to say, I can compose there. Now, certainly to stream it to you in binaural, I need these 32 milliseconds to add on top. And these are getting compensated. So one way would be to just tell the computer, do not compensate these and send it later, or have an external uh, binaural decoder. That could be cool, for example, have something that takes third order ambisonics, converts it in binaural, but with an external one, and then now you see why an external renderer is kind of beneficial because you're outputting and off you go, you know? <laughs> you can use Dante, you can use different protocols. The latency is done, you know, and the calculations are done because it takes a little bit of CPU power to do all this stuff in Atmos. But regardless, I can have these. I could even probably drive an effect in here, like for example, my avalanche run pedal still send it to the bed, call it avalanche run, right here. You send the Amiga to the avalanche run as well. And now I need to create another track with an input because that's just how my studio is done. Call it two bus return. It's a stereo track and it goes on 15, 16 because that's where my pedals return, okay? So this one needs another track. It's an audio track. It needs to be on two bus return. It's a stereo track, but it goes to standard bed and it's called two bus return. It's in solo exempt. It's monitored and has no effects, obviously. And could it, let's go to Amiga. It could work. Oh, this is what, Ambisonics? Why is it? Ah, because it's Avalanche Run goes here to standard bed. Well, actually, no, it doesn't need to go anywhere, I think. Or maybe, hmm, that's, that's, that's peculiar. Where should these go? To the standard bed? Maybe. 
That's peculiar. It shouldn't need to go anywhere. So probably... Probably for effects, what I need to do is just route them not as instruments, but as physical outputs. So for sure, this could be something that is much better because I go straight to the output as here I'm going, maybe if I go to stereo out, it should be sending it out there. Maybe there is, hold on, maybe there is not, a, maybe there's not a lot of signal going in. Nope, because this is now as an effect track going to a, a, just a track that makes no sense. Well, so probably these, no, we can't do it this way, but I could take the two bus return away and put not the avalanche run here, but call it, I don't know, ear cam. Maybe use some fancy, some fancy uh, reverb. So now, for example, I have the ear cam tools uh, verb, which is really cool. And I could play this. And this doesn't need to go to monitor stereo, but to the group's standard bed. So now... Now we have it. I'm just playing something latched from the from the, the bass line, uh, from the bass station too. I mix up the names all the time. And, uh, and it's going through the reverb and the reverb is playing. And that, believe it or not, is the Amiga behind me playing that. Uh, we can use tons of different things. We can use, I don't know, Fury. I mean, you can use stereo effects all day long, right? So go here. Sounds quite cool, actually. You see what is happening with the outputs and inputs? Why I said that having Atmos is kind of an advantage for that? Because your input and output for this specific reverb is now multi-channel. You're seeing all of the channels getting limited, or getting reverbed, right? I'm thinking limited, I'm saying limited for a reason. And I'll show you now if it works. So this is my reverb. Right, so if I send it pre-fader, I can send it this way and then use the dry wet to handle it, right? So this is the dry and this is the wet. Hear how this the the reverb keeps propagating because there's just a lot of a lot of tail as usual, and this sounds really good. This is one of my favorite reverbs for multi-channel audio. Now there's something else. A lot of processing that is done that has been done in the latest plugins is actually multi-channel compatible. One of them should be this, which if you see is a limiter in actual multi-channel. Look at that. So we can use it to limit our session. And the beauty is also really cool. And it sounds great. So let's do this.
So you see it's getting limited in multi-channel, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this thing around and you're going to see how the multi-channel influences not just the reverb, but actually the limiting stages. And that's why I would recommend you had a proper a proper limiter for multi-channel audio because usually there's probably going to be a lot of people are going to tell you I shouldn't limit anything. Uh, you have much lower levels for sure than other stuff, but if you make electronic music and things, to me it still sounds kind of makes sense. So you see now how the main channels are up, right? You see it because the first two are going up. Then I'm going to pan it. The reason why this is happening is that we have the panning perfectly centered. So I'm going to bring it up and move it around. And it works. It's moving around. Okay. The last thing I want to tell you before we close, because I think I have time for it, and it's exactly what I had planned to, is not about these just sync tracks. It's about one of the most important fundamentals for how things should be dealt with in terms of low frequency content, or for example, kicks and bass, probably as well. We're going to import one track of just a kick okay we're just gonna load it or maybe probably drag it and and pre and play just a sample i'm gonna do that i'm gonna create a track here let me just make this smaller uh, our snare track served us good but we need a mono track that goes to our standard bed for now mono and we call it kick Simple as that. Now we need a color for it before we even move into things. We're gonna make it maybe a darker brown, maybe yellow, maybe violet. Okay, no, well, it's usually base for me. I just cannot do it. But I have obnoxious colors, that's for sure, like this pink, which nobody attempts to use any longer. So we're gonna go with, with darker brown. Or what is it, this? What is this? Mocha? Okay, mocha color. <laughs> We go to Wave Libraries, my own libraries for my Prophet 12, and we're gonna pick Kick 1, whatever that is. I hope it has a lot of bass, because not all of my kicks have bass. So we're gonna play it, and in fact it doesn't. <laughs> Let's find something else. Oh, actually, I could monitor this. It's a, is it a preview channel? Okay, this one's nice. That's not. <laughs> These are my sound. Okay, we're gonna keep four. Four. Four has a ton of sub. Okay, so I make it here. Um, I have a 120 beat. That's fine. I'm just gonna go. I don't wanna do a crossfade here. Um, I'm going to. Make a copy of it here and here and here. And then just copy it over four times and then select these and then press play. Okay. Let me see if you first and foremost can hear this, which you can. And uh, we, I could try and normalize this thing, which just doesn't quite matter. Let's try and see if we can process normalize i just want to pick normalization of minus one for some reason okay that's my kick we're gonna make it even more powerful i don't want that i don't want ear come maybe ear come here yes 
of the beauty limiter. We are going to, oh, okay, maybe it was louder, but we had a limiter on, okay. Okay, that's, that's, yeah. It, it was really low volume and no subs, says Marco, which I read. And the reason was we had a limiter set at minus whatever, 20-ish something, which I've now disabled. So we no longer have the, uh, the beauty was pushing down and was like doing that kick. And I was like, well, this should be louder though. Although Atmos is kind of scaled down to a lot more dynamic range that we used to in stereo and you should not exceed way lower. Sometimes people say lower than minus 18, it still works, but you gotta have a ton of, of LUFS left. Um, so now we have it, it's kind of, right? And now, well, first off, it's getting decoded. To me, I can hear the lows and I know this sample, that's, that's correct. But I wanna give you the two stream in speakers before we move. So now I'm gonna play it again with speakers. So first and foremost, gonna start low here. You can't hear it, then I go up. So that's speakers, now headphones. There's prop, there might be a change even if it's a mono track placed center. When we go binaural, it doesn't kick you in the nuts, in the chest, just like, not in the nuts, too low, but in the guts, yes, um, as the, the stereo version. So the stereo works better because it brings it back to 2.1. Look where the kick is, it's fully centered. And there's, exactly. so Marco also says there's less lows on headphones. Right. Now, this is the last point. I think this will make it interesting, probably worth, <laughs> pro probably worth, not sure. It happens, it's just normal. But people say, why do I have less than the stereo mix? It's placed, look where the kick is. It's at completely zero height in front of me in the center channel, right? So why am I having issues with that, okay? The reason why this is happening is that the distribution of the speakers into the 7.1 renderer uh, doesn't quite work the way we would expect because the space itself is taking the energy down. Now imagine people rotate their heads and they have a kick only in a place. It could make sense, but it usually translates to a very weak uh, mix sound in Atmos. And that's a problem with a ton of mixes and works. Unless you have a very atmospheric stuff, if you have a mix that has a kick and has a four on the floor, things like that, you probably can move other stuff, but not the four on the floor. And so where do you put it? Because you cannot move the object based on the head tracking. So if I move, just please keep it centered. I don't think you really can do that. But look where the kick is in the space. It's all center channel, right? If I move it, it's all left. If I move it here, it's all right. If I move it back, it's all L, R, S. So you might say, well, we could put it into objects. No, we cannot do that. If I center just one of, make red just one of the speakers, you see now, I'm selecting only different speakers. It's just centered or now it's left, right. And you see, I can barely hear it. Right? This happens a lot. So now center, now here, now here, now here in the back which I cannot actually turn, can I? Why can't I turn it on? Oh, the rear, there we go. No, yes, no. Hmm, that's weird. I don't have access to, oh, maybe yes, because I have a rear view. Oh, that's weird. I thought I had a speaker here. See, only the RS. Okay, 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 I get it. I get it. C L S R S. 
all right? So these things need to be addressed and we need to make buses that will duplicate this kick. Or, this is two mentalities and approaches. You place this thing dead center. Let's try this, right? So we have no height whatsoever. I'm gonna disable the height control. And we have nothing, just pure center. Let's look at where the speakers are reacting. You see the problem? If you place it centered, it's S-L-S-R. This is just SL with a little bit of weird thing and that. So if I want SL and SR, I can do this like I had before with zero, zero, and, and zero. And it is a mono signal placed side left, side right, but it doesn't address our problem. What I want to do here, which is known as cardinal points to some people, and some people call it that way, and do it differently, is I want to create buses that are called, for example, north, south, west, east, something like that. And we use them to then drive the, the standard bed in a way that when we have buses, for, for, when we have sounds that are like kicks, we send them there and then they get spread out. Okay, we could do that. Now, there's different ways you can do it. For example, you could take this kick and physically send it to outputs and go to the renderer and select left, right, and side left, side right, or center, back, and all that stuff. But as you notice, you don't have all of the right channels. There's, there's not a perfect rear. There's nothing like that. So one method is to create the buses and then have the things distribute. So let's try and do that. So we need one bus that is for our kick. We're gonna call this, um, we're gonna make a group and it's uh, it's not a mono, uh, it's a mono track, but it goes to standard bed. Yes, we could do it this way, it goes to standard bed. We call it north, okay? Let's try and see what happens when we color this yellow, of course and we send this kick, the red one, to let's get rid of our uh, snare, Amiga, two bus, here come, we don't need any of that. We have our kick and we have our north. So we send these to the north. We can do it many different ways, but we're no longer going to the standard bed, we're going to north. And north goes to standard, okay? And this means that if I press play, I hear it in the center channel, right? Yes. Now we're gonna create, uh, we're gonna duplicate these and duplicate these and duplicate these. And we'll call these south, then we call these west, then we call these east, for example. And we make them all solo exempt, but, what we do is we place this perfectly south. We take the height away. Let's make sure that we got the height away. You see when this is on, I can place it, right? But if I go stop, then it's perfectly flat. And I go with the controls, not with the mouse, back, okay? And then I could send these north to the south or I can send these to the south, right? So. So now I have a perfect north and a perfect south, but if somebody turns their head and with that tracking or just the energy distribution, trust me, will not feel that right. So we need a east and we, we need a west and we need a east. So we need to place this dude all the way. This is our west now. Our west is gonna be perfectly centered, so it needs to be zero. It's not gonna have any height. It's all gonna be left, okay? But we need to send it to west. 
groups west. And now it's kicking on the left because we don't have the right, right here. So now it's done as well, no height control, and we need to route it here. Group East. Now, this thing is much different than it was before. One way we could test it would be to create an additional group, send it to North, send all of these out to the faders this way, and do um, standard bed. So if I do this, let me try a method that is going to be the fastest. So if I play it now, our kick is in the center here, or actually in the front. I could move it around, maybe a little bit here. We're going to take a look at our Dolby render just to know where the channels are going. And I'm trying, I'm going to try and move it somewhere where it makes the most energy. I don't know you, but there's no point, there's not one point that actually sounds cool to me, like beefy in a way, I would say. It, it, it just, it doesn't somehow. Um, it doesn't. It, it's just, it's clicky, there's lows, but now that we heard the other version, it, it just doesn't quite translate to me. So let's try this hit first, and then I'm going to unmute the yellows and drop the kick level down. But because these are all in pre-fader, we're going to have four copies going out to these, which are north, south, west, east. In my case here, the sample I know, it's north, south, west, east. It's with cardinal points. Now, I know that you're going to find a lot of... There's a couple engineers who made these pretty famous, but there's actually, believe me, another way of doing cardinal points that might work. But to me, this makes the most sense, probably. Um, you could do in between other scenarios and stuff, but let's try and see again what the standard bed's doing. What, which channels are triggered? You see, it's we could we could even do one channel that rules them all somehow, and I I, I kind of like to do that as well. So we we duplicate these, for example. And uh, we call the these uh, north, south, west, or cardinal, okay, uh, or cardinals. So this is cardinal points, right? That's what usually called. So we go north, we go south, we go west, we go east. We turn them all on. We remove these from here, and we only need to send the kick to cardinals. And that's the, the best thing somehow, because now we lost the panner, as you can see, and we actually could bypass the panner. I think we need to bypass the panner. Let me try that. Ooh, it doesn't sound. Why doesn't it sound? Because we're... We're so standard bed. Oh, okay, because this is going to stop. Maybe no bus. Does it work? Now, this is a nuendo kind of thing, specifically. So it could be done with sense, or maybe no. It needs to be done in a different way. But let's try this for a second. Right. Pro Tools had tons of issues with these, but mainly here's what's happening. My left, my um, kick drum is going to the Cardinals bus, which is this guy, which, in my opinion, could be made dark gold or like a dark yellow thing. It's a little bit darker, right? This is our main 
cardinals. We don't need to do anything else. Once we send a track to cardinals, it gets quadruplicated, quadrupled to north, south, west, east. But the important thing is that the cardinals bus has no output. Otherwise, we get in trouble because then we need to repan stuff or we get duplicates and then we we lean on having the kick somewhere out there which is not good okay it doesn't work that way so this is a good method it has no and, and again it's a template so you don't do gains you don't do anything the good positive thing if you have different DAWs is your main kick track if you notice no longer has pan there's no pander because it's a mono track that goes into a mono track. Can't be panned. That's a good sign. And then our Cardinals bus, in terms of output, can't be panned because there's no output. So we don't know where to distribute it. If we got no output track from that bus, we don't know how to place it in the pan panorama, right? But what matters is that we have four copies. And these four copies, they do have pans and they are hard placed front back left rear and um, front back left right if you want you could also bind some of the channels although these are placed perfectly there so it's probably right so you would do center channel or you would do left right but you would do center in this case and you would do south the other way but there's no south so you need to fake it that way i would keep the speakers on i don't kind of like to mute that Kind of, it kind of works this way. So I'm going to do one last example now, it, it, just a routing thing. I go instrument, I go base station 2, and I send it straight to card. I actually send it first to standard bed, call it base station 2. All right. And we just build a stupid MIDI thing here. All right. We go to C, C1, I don't know, maybe F1. Uh, let's hear this. <laughs> maybe, maybe not this sound, but but I want this, right? Okay. This, this. Okay. Awesome. How beautiful is that? So now this bass, we're gonna find the patch that we like. Could, could be that, but I want to make it a little bit more badass. Hold on. Something simple. Now, this that we we're hearing, it's a track that goes to the standard bed. Again, it's got the same issues. Where do we put it? Do we put it in object mode? No, because we'll even lose the LFE. Or do we put it in bad mode? Well, where? Well, we don't put it to bad mode. Instead of having it play this way, all right, with the kick, where's, where's our kick? Play kick. Right? We send it to Cardinals. And now, you feel it on your headphones? It's, it's a complete, uh, completely different bass, like a foundation. It's a completely different. It sounds, I mean, this is not the best match for sure for to try it out. It's also pitching kind of down and up, but how it's presenting itself, it's completely different. So if now we take the Amiga thing and we go here and we do, I don't know. Oh, that's, that's my, no, don't do that. <laughs> I have a local channel that I have to turn on. 
otherwise we're gonna keep playing our baseline there okay so we have this right let's just do like a let's do this uh let's actually write it down copy it here and this doesn't need to be okay so this is here this is who's this guy ah oh, no wait hold on we had an f okay so we go here here and here oh this doesn't play what doesn't play it's too fast probably <laughs> this is never gonna play okay let me try this all right so let's do let's do it in halves or maybe maybe does it play poly maybe yes right okay it's not playing that <laughs> oh because it's too low all right i see that uh it's the scene Okay, it's the Amiga synth that doesn't doesn't reach the. Oh, we crashed. Did we? No. Yes. What? No. <laughs> Second desktop. All right. All right. This is nice. Let's do this. This is exactly what we wanted. Okay. Okay. That's that's beautiful. It's exactly what we wanted. But this one doesn't need to actually go to the Cardinals, right? This we can move, for example. With the ear come, without, doesn't matter, but we'll keep the ear come where it is. Let's try that. Okay, and now we'll try and do this. Try and move it, right? We'll do read, write. See that? Now I would do something else. I would place it a little bit higher. I would do probably a width thing. Okay, and try and do this. Right, for example. And we can send these to the LFE as well and do it just at the end. Oh, just something super stupid. But now, because the kick and, and bass stay there, we don't need to go, I mean, we just need one thing that moves. And to me, this kind of translates much better. Also, what I'm gonna try and do with you now at the end is, I'm gonna send it to you as a speaker format. Okay, let's try this. Now back to binaural. You see where I'm going? The template we have works in terms of sending, working everything in Atmos, the plugins are in Atmos, Things are moving the way the plugins were developed for, were developed around, probably that's the right term. Then we have a monitoring that's going through the ambisonics into our streams in binaural, can still be monitored for somebody else in another channel in binaural, and goes to speakers if you want. It loads HRTF profiles of other people in the streams, whatever, but also makes use of Cardinal 
point information. So some things are anchored down. Even if for some reason the, la the cardinal points are not used and it still feels like a nice kind of vibe, I can guarantee you that if you don't do this, and that's I haven't invented it, it's been discussed at AES as well and tons of other things, if you don't force the reset of a mono strength, or not a mono, but a coherent full signal strength from the loudspeakers, to offset what's moving, you will not have a strong foundation. So just to summarize, why uh, does this work? Why does, why does the cardinal points kind of way of doing it translates to a stronger, bouncier, beefier mix in binaural, okay? Its main purpose is not binaural. If you fold it back to stereo, this thing will kick way more butt than anything done with a kick placed in front of you. It just doesn't work that way. The way the decoder translates it to stereo 2.0 will give you a weaker center mass, okay? So when you mix in stereo, what are our low frequencies like usually? Mono, right? Centered and mono. What does it mean? It means that we ask from our two speakers in stereo to be equally shooting at us the kick drum and bass, for example, okay? The low frequency information we want centered and mono. It's not a rule, it's, it, you don't have to, but how many times have you done it? Tons, right? I've, I always have the low frequency inf information centered and strongly presented in mono because this tells my speakers, my two speakers, to shoot coherently at my listening spot the low frequency info and that gives it that boltsy sound. The same thing applies to an Atmos environment, but to do it, you need four monos, okay? Sort of. <laughs> you need four cardinal points that shoot bass into the center position of the audience, of your listening position. It's just how it is. I haven't invented it. It's been an AES talk. There's mastering engineers who's discussed it but it does cover a lot of the ground that we lost in terms of bolsy energetic mixes. When Atmos came out, some things that were atmospheric were fun, but the things that were energetic were kind of better in stereo, especially on headphones, especially in stereo mixes. In binaural, you could get cheated if there's tons of other things, or if you have like a guitar singer songwriter it kind of feels cool you place it somewhere you have the environment there's tons of virtual reality for your ears that is fantastic but if you have a four on the floor very strong kind of mix and then you make an atmos version for it and you just place that kick in the front somewhere or even close to the center it will not work i've demonstrated it to you using north south west east four shooting points at the center for your low frequency content does deliver a better, more coherent mix. In your binaural, in your Atmos, I guarantee you that because, you know, you get shot into that 7.1.2. So it does work on your actual physical system if you have one. But most importantly, it folds back to stereo, which is the automatic process that your distributors will do when they take the ADM and make different versions, the stereo from the ADM will actually be as boltsy as you would want the stereo mix to be. So the mystery has been solved that way. So far, the cardinal points work. The additional information was if you're using spatial movements like these, probably these sort of pad, it would be kind of better to put it into an object. So to do this, just so that we have kind of a complete scenario, you go into project, you go into your ADM authoring, and you create an object for it. You create an object, and this is my Amiga pad, and it's got my Amiga input. So the input of this is Amiga, and I say, I don't know, music, I place it either mid or far, that's the object ID and I play it around 
and then I move these not and this has now moved to object mode and this is simple as that exactly as it was before but now you have an object size a width it just reacts differently so let's do a final listening just just for kicks I can move these around so we'll listen to it you have binaural now so just listen with headphones and we uh, I'll alternate between bed and object it's usually better with with object modes when you have to fly stuff around a lot It's subtle because the ob because the width isn't exactly there. So it's I mean it, it's a it's a left right polar synthesizer thing. But if I move it around, maybe in object mode, it's kind of easier. Wow! <laughs> yes, by all means, the back is just much better. I'm gonna just go front to back. Okay, just passing fast from left front to back right. It's much better. So objects should be employed when you're floating sounds. And you see how stereo doesn't quite cut it? If, if you know, I like tons of mono sources. Uh, having stereo things that you move, mm, I don't know, maybe a tiny little bit of space, but, or maybe you can even play with this thing, like just open the width, but having heavy stereo things moving around is a little bit too much. You hear it? Now bear in mind, this Amiga synthesizer plays one note left, one right, one left, one right, because it's a four voice chip, okay? So it's really the reason why I wanted to use it because it has strong panning content. It doesn't quite work when moved around, you know, and this would probably be better in object mode, place static and just maybe open up a little bit, you know, but if you want to keep moving things around, probably go in object, make it mono or just narrow it down and don't place it. But the front or back in object mode is just great. <laughs> Especially with higher frequencies, that's just cool. So another way you can, you can you handle this is just change the panner and go to, to energy panner. It's just a completely different version, right? This is now handling the energy of the sound to pan stuff. So it's a completely weird way of doing it and it's kind of automated and it's kind of nice. Let's try and play with it. See what it's doing? It's based on the energy, the, the dynamics are moving the sound. So it's volume, it's moving the thing. That's also the nice thing. You see, you can do all sorts of outputting and things around, you can do slides. You can do, there's an attack and release. It's just quite nice because of how it just employs the, the movement of stuff. See, you have the two points from the left and right coming to a thing, it's just, it's just insane. And it was free for some time.
If I move my volume fader, this thing is actually going to react differently because it's got more volume and the panner is past it, so it will feel different. Look at how it moves. Hear it? It's just doing that thing with, with just slides and two or one single point. It's just great for little details because they move a little bit and just give things a different vibe. I think it works better in object mode um, for the, the the panning in the in the multi mixer, but energy panner is also a very cool thing. And there's another plugin that I have from them, which is like Air Air Music, and this sets the distance of a sound. This is also very cool. Uh, you can set the distance and it will just scoop the air the right way, the high frequencies, and also lower the sound by an amount. Like, I like 0.2 sometimes. So let's keep it there uh, with just the normal panner that we had, the multi here. Put it here in the center. <laughs> it's really cool. Okay, so 1 dB for this sound placed there kind of makes it feel that it's kind of going away, right? There's a filter that's, that's moving on this, obviously, but even if I do it fast, the combination of volume drop and high frequency change is really cool. It just makes it completely move around and this is this is also a super simple plugin that helps you a lot with different types of sound but in general this is this is the gist at least for your main template and how you handle that so there's a ton of stuff for sure like this is this is a lot wow and taking my headphones off after so much time it's like oh the room feels so different with the reverb and stuff but so i hope these has helped you understand that it is complicated. It is complicated. There's tons of things that one must take into account and the basics of your workflow are driven by Nuendo, which has a lot of possibilities, sometimes too much, and it's easy to just get derailed. That's for sure. Uh, I'll give you that, it's true. Everything can go into everything. Everything can can bypass everything or, or use it or there's different names that are similar for the same stuff. There's sometimes the same name for different things. You get what I mean, right? But working with immersive audio is not as complicated as people make it. It's just a matter of understanding some basic principles. So we did it for Atmos. We work in the Atmos environment, which have usually tons of mono sounds or stereo stamps. We work in bed mode or object mode. We send it out to a renderer, which keeps working in 7.1.4 and all is good. And that will create our ADM file. And that creates the final master that gets distributed. That's okay. But we then stem out from the renderer one 30A third order ambisonics bus. That is our main mix that is monitored by our phones, headphones. These will have the VST Ambi decoder, which makes it binaural. And this allows us to mix things. We also stem from the third order ambisonics, we stem to the stereo mix for monitoring things in stereo. For example, for me to you for the stream or for a different set of speakers or somebody over Zoom or Skype that want to listen, maybe on speakers, maybe on headphones. You select which kind of translation you want. You can even load their HRTF profile. They will have it, they will hear in real time on their headphones in binaural and you can have online you know, chats and sessions for sure. You can also route these to a stereo fold down if you just wanna print a stereo mix, but the foundation of a trick to let these all work peacefully is the addition of the cardinal points approach, which is not mine. It's been discussed by tons of other engineers. It's building up. It's a principle by which you create four strong points for low frequency content for songs that need it. For example, 
heavy kicks, you know, heavy subs, things that in the stereo field with two speakers would just give you a ton of punch. In order not to lose the punch, the cardinal points get used as a busing system for everything that needs to be low frequency content punch. This will make the Atmos mix punchier than other stuff that doesn't employ it, the fold down to binaural punchier, and the stereo mix down fold from the ADM punchier as well. So it's a win-win-win all the time, all right? Once you set it up, it's in your template, everything flows. Remember, because it's in Atmos 7.1.4 or 2 environment, tons of plugins are already available. You don't need tons of them, and most of the DAWs, Nuendo included, have a lot of tools. Just some nice reverb. It's more about moving a few things in a nice way, I would say, rather than completely confusing things just because you can. You don't need to move stuff. Just have a right ambience and reverb and distance, and that it's all you need, right? Objects versus bed. Bed you use for things that are more static and open, and you use objects for things that really fly around like an effect, right? Because Atmos tends to position objects better. That's pretty much it. Now you can rewind this video, watch it again a trillion times, and then maybe it will work. Thank you very much, people. It's been fantastic. See you next time. Ciao.